Buongiorno a tutti. Um, io per, direi per um, aiutarvi a capire, preferirei parlare in inglese. Innanzitutto penso che possa servire anche a voi, in quanto molti concetti um, dovranno essere a livello internazionale um, collegati alla lingua inglese e poi vi risparmiate tante, um, tanti sbagli che faccio. Ormai sono 40 anni che non vivo in Italia e il mio vocabolario è limitato. Se, se Fabio non mi dice stop, io continuo in inglese. Continua pure in inglese. Okay, so. Abbiamo parlato, scusami, fino ad ora in italiano perché abbiamo verificato che nel panel tutti parlano italiano. No, certo, io non, non voglio, cioè non, non è per, per snobismo o altro, ma penso che sia assolutamente importante, come dirà più tardi, essere il più inclusivi possibile e questo vuol dire che dobbiamo poter attrarre in Italia eh, scienziati e eh, collaboratrici da tutto il mondo e la, la lingua non deve essere una barriera, tutti vogliono imparare l'italiano perché è una lingua stupenda, dove si può cantare bene e parlare bene, parlare d'amore, ma ehm, in, diciamo che la lingua franca rimane ehm, l'inglese. Ok, so um, forgive me, I hope I will not, you know, my, my, <laughs> my English is Italian anyway, so you will understand um, what I say. Ok, so very briefly I tell you what uh, my talk will be. Um, I will give you a little bit of the background of where these opportunities that I have, um, let's say, taken have been generated so that you understand, you know, the social, economic, cultural, um, let's say, environment that is required um, to, or that was important for this. And then I tell you a bit the, of the, about the spin-off stories that are maybe case studies for you. And, and very briefly, I will speak about the lessons learned and the recommendations. So what you see here is the facade of the Institute that I'm sitting in right now. Um, it's, um, it's a beautiful building because it was actually um, done together with an artist called Peter Kogler, um, a Tyrolean artist who has done this facade that, that resembles networks, and I'm not gonna um, go into any of this detail, but it's part of, uh, of the uh, trying to be, um, let's say, attractive and, and interested to the outside world. I think the human technopole is a fantastic example of great architecture, um, and, and, and you are familiar with it, or you should be familiar. So very briefly, the Institute um, is called Research Center for Molecular Medicine. It belongs to the Austrian Academy of Sciences. It's a bit like a CNR, it's a bit like a Max Planck. It's, um, let's say, non-profit and academic, but not a university. And the peculiarity, we are incorporated as a Gesembaha, we, um, sort of, which gives us a lot of additional freedom. Um, there are about, uh, sort of, 19 different group leaders, we call them principal investigators, and some of them are in the building and some of them are outside the building, especially in the medical departments. It's a young place, I'm by far the oldest, and um, we have already 49 nations out of 180 people, so it gives you a sense of how, um, how important and how I think um, sort of it's possible to um, be Um, sort of international. Austria is not a particularly bigger advantage than other cities in Italy, so I'm sure something that um, we can try to achieve everywhere. And we roughly spend a little bit over 20 million a year, half of which comes from the government through the Academy of Sciences and half of which we recruit from um, other fundings. Very briefly about myself, I'm 60, I'm Italian, I'm the director of this place. Fabio told you I'm a member of Scientific Committee of the Human Technopoly, fantastic responsibility and privilege. I founded several companies and I'm a promoter of research, but also social innovation in research. And I think that is sort of a, something that I'm specializing that I find very, very interesting. So something that is interesting to you, but also I'm the first person, <laughs> I brag about this, but I'm the first person in any German speaking country whose genome is non um, anonymized online. So people can look up every little nucleotide. This is a decision that I took with my children. They are both um, adults. Um, and so I have no secret, and I, for years I put under my um, signature, please tell me something about me from my genome that I do not know, and, and nothing ever came. I know the few um, diseases, the genetics that I have, one is a, a typical Italian beta thalassemia, heterozygote, but also I have a good proportion of Neanderthal genome, something that um, according to um, you know, recent research and the Nobel Prize of Medicine in 2022, One probably could have derived also from the shape of my nose, 
Okay, so becoming a bit more serious, our institute um, is working according to five principles. And I tell you this because obviously this is relevant for the creation of spin-off. One is we are um, interested in technologies. Without the tools, you cannot make new discoveries. And I think that we all are aware that the technology development is at the forefront of most, um, let's say, new findings and, in, and, and, and new understanding in the life sciences as it is in, in physics or, or most other sciences. The other important principle that we're interested to um, explore the roots of disease. Now, the zillions of institutes are doing this. We have the opportunity of being very close to, to the medical world because we're located in the center of the hospital. And so this is something that we do very seriously, but it's, it's the roots, it's, it's the basic mechanism. It is not applied research. At the same time, we push opportunities into medical applications. I mean, we are, we are not programmatic. We don't tell people what they should do in terms of research, the free-minded, free um, curiosity-driven basic research, but it is in a very medical context. And it is, let's say, so that they, it's very easy to contextualize in a medical sense because of our location and our mandate. Very important is that to empower talent. So we are a training place for everybody, not just for the postdocs and the, and, and the students, but also for the principal investigators. We don't give tenure, but also for the administration personnel. We all are on a learning curve and aware of this and, and sort of take care that this is something we keep doing. And then we are dedicated to multiplying by sharing, meaning that we are mindful of open access. We're mindful of publishing in time. We're mindful of giving um, reagents as much as possible. Now, I think I think that um, uh, sort of the, the the sort of the the president um, of the Human Technopol, Gianmario Verona, spoke about sort of the the important um, innovation that that one can witness in the rapidity by which some of the COVID treatments um, came up. Both the discovery of Plaxovid. Um, uh, under two years, a completely new drug, or not completely, but a new drug, and, um, and of course the vaccines and their approval. And so we were a little bit fed up with a lot of the no-vax kind of people who say, how can this be if it was done so quickly? Um, what is, how can it be that this is not a trick or something um, weird? And, and what we were upset about is that people do not fully understand that behind every pill and every vaccine, there are decades of research by a large group of people. You know, it, probably in the range of several thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people. If you, if you count the basic research that has led to the knowledge that has led to the application that has led to um, all the possible invention and then sort of the development and the clinical testing. So it's an army of people doing a lot of work over decades. And so we decided to, to make sure that people understand that inside a pill, inside any pill, there is a lot of research. And so our slogan changed and we started to picture ourselves um, as people inside the pill saying inside every pill um, there is medicine. And so our slogan changed to science is our medicine, meaning that it is clear, it's a pun, so in Gioco di Paolo, so you're, you're trying to say that in sort of there is science inside of medicine, at the same time, we live of science. And so our research report is packaged like a pill of, um, of pills and, and so on and so forth. And I think this is a campaign that is trying to um, sort of explain the importance of basic research for innovation down the line, which is a theme also of these days. Very, very briefly, it's not too important. We mainly focus on immunity, infections, and let's say um, autoimmunity, metabolism, cancer, um, aging and rare disorders. So what, what don't we do? We don't do much CNS work. Um, I will skip um, quite um, a lot of this. This is also just to give you a sense of the diversity that we have in terms of um, faculty, because they are not only in our building, but they, there are sort of virtual faculty members that are at the medical university and also in other places, which gives a much broader, let's say, access to expertise, a variety of expertise. What you see here is an air view of the campus that we're sitting in, and this whole campus that you see each and every building is something to do, has something to do with the hospital, or um, with the University of Medicine and teaching. 
and we are in the middle of it. And so it's a very, and we are independent. I say we are like Villaggio Gallico uh, nella, nella, nella Britannia occupata um, dai Romani. Cioè we are, we are the rebels because we don't belong um, to, um, to the medical university, although I'm also a professor there, but the important point is that we are independent in terms of budget. And so we are in a way um, profiting from all of this without um, having to be um, in that direction. I tell you this because of course it's important to the discussion today. And there are 2000 medical doctors and, and, and millions of patients, outpatients going in and out of this campus, which is very, very important. Another thing that is important for you, I think, in the, in the um, sort of life science innovation, um, let's say value creation chain, is that we are very mindful of the boundary between what we do in our, let's say, basic research competence and the medical world by respecting it and by knowing and having the partners when we, when we pass over um, something and, and when we are using patient material and when we are using clinical information, we are very, very careful to, to, to not trespass the boundary without awareness and knowledge of everybody involved. Because we don't want to be an alternative program um, to the medical program. We want to be the preparatory, or if you want, the science inside um, the medicine. So another thing that I don't want to go into details, but I think is important, is that we are an institution like the Human Technopole that is dedicated on excellence meaning that we are more interested in the quality than the quantity of what we are doing. And um, you know, we have many ERC grants and, and, and some of um, people here receive prizes and so on and so forth. But I think it's very important to say that the average impact factor of our papers is typically higher than 10, meaning that we try to publish in better journals. Now we know that journal impact factors is, a, is not an important parameter, but it's still, indicative, if you want, of the ambition of a place. So we are trying to do that, and I'm not gonna take you through this. We are 15 years of age, and we are um, pretty happy about, let's say, how we were able to establish excellence or the ambition to be making true innovation, not making derivative research um, in the entire organization. I'm not gonna go through this slide. Enough to say that there are three areas where we are, let's say, better than that we are good. One is the genomics, um, historically identified very interesting new genes. The other one is technology, technology particular single cell analysis, epigenomic, um, but also um, a few other uh, processes. And the third one is drug discovery. If drug discovery in an academic sense, in a sense um, that is um, associated, let's say with, and I can send you this slide, so it's not. I, I show you this slide because I'm very proud of the fact that a technology developed at, um, in our institute was recently used, or in the last two years, was used in a clinical trial based on imaging of the efficacy of drugs in the blood of patients or in certain pools, in, in, in samples from the blood of patients in, in very severe blood cancers, actually, um, ones that had previous. And, and it showed um, a, a very interesting um, capability in improving um, the outcome of the treatments that were determined by this um, technology. So meaning that even if we're only 15 years old, there is already a clinical trial that was based on something that we discovered, which I think is very important. And now this is something that I think you should um, think about. And that is what we, what I believe is at the, at the core of much of what we do, and also of the spin-offs, is that we are very cooperative. Meaning that everybody in the building or in the um, virtual um, place does not require approval from anybody to collaborate. So the students don't have to say, you know, can I talk to the other person? Can I get these reagents? Can I get this technology? Everybody is able to share this. And so the students among themselves are making a lot of very interesting collaborations. Of course, the PI needs to know it or is, she, she should know it or she should know it, but it's very important that this is. And so it results in a, a very, very high number of collaborative papers and a very, very high index of how many different labs an individual lab works with. And if you say, okay, we all do this, I can tell you that all the institutes we compare are, um, are doing it four to five times less than we do. So it's a, it's a real, if you want, um, fingerprint of our institution to be very collabor collaborative. And I think that teaches everybody in the organization, students and postdocs, and also PIs, to take away the fears of, you know, but then what do we do with authorship, but then what would we do with this? 
and, and opens um, a sort of the ability to be uh, freely innovative. And that is very important because, as you know, and it, it's almost impossible these days to have all the required capability and technologies within one individual laboratory. Um, the other point is to really cherish and worship diversity. Diversity is not some politically correct, something that comes um, out of uh, so some crazy uh, US college. Diversity is the essence of um, innovation. To think about sort of the success that was cherished by both Gian Mario Verona and Fabio of Italy, it comes from the fact that Italy is a very open country um, and the Mediterranean and since you know, 10,000 years has um, had um, a lot of input from different cultures, from different people, um, and so on and so forth. Think about sort of Renaissance times. So that is very, very important also in any institution. So diversity is something that you really should, and it's not about sort of how many, um, if you want geographical um, and ethnic diversity you have, is really way of thinking, is really sort of background, is really, uh, tolerant of different um, things and think that is very, very important. And then we foster creativity. And I think that is also important because innovation is not something technical. Innovation is also something very cultural. I think that was also mentioned. And so we welcome people. So in our institute, people feel well when they come. We empower people. So the culture of empowerment, we create trust. People don't have to fear. People don't have to worry that people are unkind. You know, the kindness is our most important principle. So everybody's kind, if you're kind and you keep being kind, even a cane bastonato, even a person that has learned to bite because she or he were in a very hostile and toxic environment, slowly opens up and learns how to contribute and learns how to appreciate the contributions of others. And then certainly it's very, very important that you have a, um, a, a, a situation where um, everybody should feel responsible, but also entitled to rights and, and duties. That is very, very important. And then also a culture where the translation of what we do for society is part of why we can use taxpayers' money, either directly from Austria or from the European Union, so also your taxes, um, to do the kind of joyful and innovative research we're doing. We can't do this if we don't think about um, what can we give back in terms of translating this for the benefit of society is very, very important. So this brings me now to why start a company. So what we feel is that as a, as a, as a researcher in the 21st century, it is very important that to translate this finding is considered, let's say, a vehicle to affect our lives. So it's not to say, oh, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I publish it and then somebody else will care about what part. Yes, it's true. You're only contributing a little piece to a big, 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 um, let's say tower or a big puzzle. But it's also true that you need to be mindful of this to know whether there is an opportunity um, that allows you um, to do that. If you wanna start a company, that is a strong motivation. Another thing that can motivate you to start a company, that is important to you irrespective of whether you're starting a company yourself or whether you will help people to start a company is that many ideas that you have are not, you cannot scale up um, by doing it very well, very professionally, millions of times, or at least thousands of times or hundreds of times, if you don't have the capability of making a company where it, this, this particular um, feature is um, central. In other words, if you are interested in a particular topic, is not easy to be as deep and as rigorous as you are in an industrial setting. So industry is a place where through access of different funds, you may get um, a different level of um, robustness in what you're trying to do. Another great thing is that by starting a company, you create jobs, you create opportunities and you foster talent. It's not a, simp it's not a, a small thing, particularly for a group leader, um, where you have a lot of talented people and, and you'd like to know that they have um, good and interesting uh, opportunities and jobs after. Most importantly, as a human being, you are challenged to a degree that otherwise you would not be easily challenged because the, the learning curve you're on is incredibly steep. You learn about many more things than just your scientific aspect. And I think that is inebriating, that is sort of really energizing and, and very good fun 
And so if before um, your institution was a little bit like a golden cage, you were um, operating, let's say, um, in an era that is very circumscribed and very focused, and you cannot tell your friends exactly what they what you're doing because they don't understand. If you start a company, people start understanding what you're doing because you're trying to valorize, to do something out of your research. And inevitably, it takes you out of the building into understanding, I don't know, graphics, waste disposal, um, legal matters, financial matters, and so on and so forth. So suddenly, you are going beyond your academic world. The other thing that I find fascinating is that it really takes you um, a great faith in the future to do so. I mean, if you are semi-depressed on a great day in Milan, there is a lot, in Vienna there is even more, in the winter and you say, you know, am I in the right job? You know, I'm not making enough money to suffer like this and so on and so forth. But if you make a company, you are really um, throwing, let's say, uh, <laughs> I don't know, a bouquet of flowers in the future. You're really throwing um, a, li a lifeline into the future and you say, I believe that there will be something that comes out of this baby that we are creating. So it is the idea of um, creating the trust in the future that will pull people into being, let's say, um, supportive and being positive and, and being contributing um, to this. And, um, and this is also very nice and very liberating because it opens up, if you want, in a personal sense, your responsibility towards society, but also towards, as I say, um, trusting in, in, in the future. Here we have um, the founders of Allsight, or some of the founders of Allsight, um, leaving Sam, and I gave them this trumpet um, as a present, as sort of the, the, the symbol of the sound, uh, of the bold sound that should, um, let's say, accompany them. And, um, and ult ultimately, what I would like to say is that it is an, an act of creation. It's an act of creation that um, is an incredible feeling because you're creating something that did not exist before and where you cannot, let's say, foresee how big it will become and how long it will live, but it is clearly um, a big creation because it will have its own dynamic. There will be its own financial sustainability, will have its own... Um, people working there, its own, and so on and so forth. So it's an it's an incredibly um, it's an incredible act of creation. By by it's it's like not putting um, one tree in the garden. It's like putting a forest. You know, it's it's something that has a lot of um, size and potential. Just briefly on a, on a on a on a personal, um, how did I um, let's say become in, in love with biotech? Is uh, when I was a student, so um, I was 25. I had the privilege of spending a year of my PhD in the laboratory of Dave Godel at Genentech. Genentech was then only about a thousand people, um, and and it was an incredibly interesting year. I learned a lot, and clearly I learned that. Um, in, in contrast to what I thought, uh, people in biotech were very collaborative and very open. Um, and so it was not like I would imagine that people were totally secretive, wearing sunglasses and not talking to each other. The opposite was, was true, much, much more than the University of Zurich where I was before. So it really made me see that fantastic research can be done in a biotech setting. And, and um, on, a, on a personal experience level, it can be at least as rewarding as a good um, lab. So um, these are the, 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 the companies that I founded um, directly. I mean, there were companies that I helped, but these are the companies that I founded directly. Um, so the company CellZone in 2000 was the first experience. I also went to work for the company. I became scientific director there and I was head of site and that site was mainly there. So it was really the job. Um, it was an incredibly um, interesting experience. It was bought by GSK um, in the year 2000, I mean, the year um, 2000 and I don't remember, 12 or something like this. Um, and, um, and yeah, and uh, now it's, it's a thriving place with 300 people, as I say, and belongs to GSK. Um, when I was in Vienna, we founded a company, Haplogen, I'll speak a little bit more about this. It was dealing with, excuse me, and Selzom was dealing with interaction proteomics or protein complexes 
and, and, and how drugs affect them and how you can identify the, the targets of drugs by using proteomics. And haplogen was working with haploid cells, human haploid cells, to be able to identify, um, if you want, do um, somatic cell genetics, those genetics um, in a petri dish with human cells. It was before CRISPR. Um, CRISPR took some sale out of it, but we still were able to sell half of the genomics uh, business to Horizon Discovery. Allsight is a company that was founded a little bit later. Um, all of these were founded by us, and us meaning other me and other PIs um, in the building or postdoc or students. And then um, we'll come to that in a second. Allsight um, was, is, was making um, this technology that I showed you in the clinical trial, which is the ability of using uh, PBMCs or uh, mononucleated cells from the blood of people to see which drug actually works. And if you have a, a particular um, disease, you can try to see select the drug that works. And out of this came a lot, a lot of other possibilities. And the company was acquired by Accentia, that is a, um, a publicly noted um, large um, UK biotech company. Uh, recent spin-offs are Proxygen and Solgate, and I'll speak a little bit more about this. A and you see, um, what you see in this picture is that you see that there is a little bit of fleck of um, women which is something that I think should be of great concern of, um, to the industry, and we'll come to speak about that as well. But other than this, um, it's, um, it's an incredibly nice experience to create team. Here in a tabular form, a little bit, um, what are the parameters I spoke about when they were done um, out of the institutions? It was not only out of SEM, there was also some cases, the Whitehead um, involved, or um, in some other cases, ISTA, which is Institute of Science and Technology, Austria. Um, and then, uh, as shown here, and then um, the areas of business, different things typically have to do something with drug discovery, but by getting to um, a new technology, um, different sort of money raised in different times. Um, we come to that a little bit more, but typically not gigantic, gigantic rounds and, and typically starting um, in a local sense, because um, I, at, at CellZone, the first company I've done, I have experienced how intense it becomes when you are essentially working for um, VCs and, and their funds. The kind of serenity that is a sort of, you're never quite serene, is always, you're always under pressure, but the pressure that is before you are endorsing a large international VC company is, is a different kind of pressure that you are, uh, that is more, uh, let's say, easy to create. Um, uh, the company culture in and, and, and create the technology basis uh, before um, you go, um, let's say, out and seek um, additional investors. Um, the number of employees varied. And of course, in those cases where they were um, bought, um, it grew up um, very fast. So very quickly, typically, um, the different spin-offs were incubated at SEMP for about a year, maybe less, never before, never more. Um, there was always some sort of patent or patent group at the basis. And as you know, this is very important, particularly to attract investors. It's not really operationally fundamentally important because often you end up um, relying on other patents that you create and so on and so forth. But you need to have patents to have um, something that is um, supporting your unique selling point and, your, and the reason why they should invest in you. It was very important in this country, but also in other countries to access public, what you can call pre-seed funding. So um, small amount of money, hundreds of thousands of, of, of euro um, that you need to establish your, your proof of concept, your technology. Um, we relied a lot on business angels that we knew, people we trusted, people that were not in for a short return, but had a longer vision, people who were experienced, people that would give advice, so luckily there are at least three fellows that we know that were previous or current, um, let's say investors or, or had been in biotechs themselves that have enough money to support the ecosystem. And these are very, very nice people because they are able to give you true support rather than um, a sort of performance stress. Of course there is performance stress, but it's a different kind. Then very important, this country, you can get serious public seed funding. Um, it, some of it um, is for free, meaning that you don't have to pay back. Some of this 
is contingent of your success, you may have to pay back um, to some extent. Then you typically go to an additional round with the same or additional business angels and small local VCs that are associated with, um, let's say, the academic world. And then what we always tried is to, to get validation and some offset of the cost by early partnering with, for example, with industry, with larger industry, typically with pharma. That was always useful um, without giving out too many rights or without uh, sort of having all the best people working just for that. Um, but it's important to offset the cost. And here is Enrico Girardi, one of the postdocs um, who um, founded, uh, who was involved in, in, um, in Solgate here at the so-called Vienna Science Board, because Vienna has a, has a lot of boards and one is the Science Board. Um, what about IP is, of course, um, how it works in our institution is that we have to file an invention record. It's done by the scientist. You give it to the IP office and or to management. And also you try to say who, from your point of view, contributed how much to which invention. So, um, you know, you have to find an agreement. I prefer agreements where everybody has equal parts because it puts people in different kinds of obligations in the future but it doesn't raise the question of um, who has more into that. We try to do the same also with founding shares. Um, typically then it's evaluated by the IP person. We have one IP person um, in our institution, but also by me or other um, scientists. And then we always, not always, when there is merit, we um, use a very experienced, trusted law firm that we know and we've been working now 15 years with. This is um, animated wrongly. Um, so, Typically, we ask people in the invention record to say something about, about the commercialization potential, not only what can you do with it, the kind of diseases they may address, but also if they have in mind companies that could be interesting in, in licensing the invention um, or who could be using it. Um, and then we just, if, if, if all of this looks good, then we decide to invest in figuring out um, with the lawyers whether there was um, prior art. I mean, that is, if you want, um, already quite an investment. And then we decide whether or not to patent. And it's important to know that there is, there is a law in Austria, but I think that um, there are similar laws um, in most countries that um, protect the rights of the inventors. So what we do is, and this is something that the, um, everybody knows when they sign our contract, is that out of the commercialization of this particular invention that for which you have um, your inventor, um, the, the income if generated should be divided into three parts. One part is for the inventors, one is for the laboratory of the inventors, and one is for the institution. Okay, this is Ariel Ben-Simon, another founder of Solgate at another um, science board. So what was a very nice success for us was the acquisition of Orsite by Accentia um, a year ago. Um, this is, um, you see um, Gregory Bradmer and Nicholas Kral, both were postdoctoral fellows in my lab, um, and they are um, very happy multimillionaires. Of course, the multimillionaires comes with a hook, meaning that you cannot sell your shares for quite some time. Maybe by the time you, you, you sell it, the company is not as, as, as valuable and so on and so forth. But there were also some cash payments that they enjoyed. And so they're happy. Both of them um, are um, in their mid-30s. Another thing that is going very well is Proxygen. Um, Proxygen is only two years old. You see here to the right um, a picture. I was not there, but I sent this uh, number two in flowers um, that was uh, only about uh, a, a few uh, months ago. But at the same time, they already have um, a few uh, collaborations, one of which with, with Merck that was nominated for deal of the year because it was about 500 million um, bio dollars, as you know, bio, bio, Euro, bio um, euros, you know, these are, um, let's say, potential if the milestones are met, but still the upfront payment was handsome, and we are very, very happy because this company is dealing with molecular glues, so these are small molecules that are conferring no, new functions to proteins, typically leading them to degradation, but not only, and I want to point out here um, to individuals, both Bernd and Matthias were students with us, um, Bernd, in the meantime, had gone on to Porsche Design for um, learning consultancy, but Matthias went straight from his PhD into the company. Um, both are founders and both um, are um, sort of very, very, very um, intense. Matthias actually is, is from Milano. Um, he um, grew up in Milano. 
And um, last but not least, the company Sel uh, Solgate is, is working on transporters. I think here um, it's it still a bit earlier age. For the first time, there is um, a woman co, um, usually me here with Gaia Novarino. Gaia um, is an Italian neuroscientist working at Institute of Science and Technology Austria. So um, this change a little bit, you know, the testosterone um, balance um, within founders. Here we are considering um, the graphics and, and, and we're using dancers that are engaging molecules to um, show transport. This is a um, work in pro progress. Um, They're constantly hiring um, so if you're interested in these companies, it is easy to find. So what, am I, what is the success? What are the fruits coming out of this? For sure, what, is, what I'm incredibly proud of is that there are now, now more scientists working in the spin-offs of this institution than in the institution. So you have to imagine this. Take the Human Technopole, and the Human Technopole, out of its own, has created jobs for more people than its houses. Just scientists working on related projects. This is really an impressive and, and, and I think very, very important point, which, which gives you the sense of how technology transfer can create a world and, 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 and if you want a whole um, ecosystem that will um, keep um, indefinitely um, going. Here, a part of the ecosystem, Jay Bredner, who was until recently the head of research of Novartis, was um, at a conference that we organized and these and, and and you know many of these people are ended up um, sort of here you see the two uh, founders of um, of all side um, Tillman went on to do another company that I didn't speak about um, and, um, and 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 many more um, are involved in um, sort of new businesses so the other second reason is that the the personal development that you see of the students and the postdocs is just amazing. You know, they're unrecognizable because they learn very quickly um, how to lead, they learn very quickly how to assume responsibility, they learn very quickly how to deal with the multi-parameters um, that are beyond what you typically do when you have to do research and, and, and do papers. Um, I mentioned the fact that you are, uh, the fruits are the creation of a whole group of people that are familiar with the topics, that includes technicians that know how to write reports, that know how to present data, that know how to be very rigorous, that know how to document at a different level, and so on and so forth, and, and all sort of people, people who know how to do PowerPoint presentation, how to do graphics, people, and, 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 and particularly things that, at the interface with business and economics. Um, and I mentioned the other um, technologies. But then it's not only roses and flowers, right? I mean, let me talk briefly, and this is a little bit from an Austrian perspective, but I think it's European in general. So in general, and I think I, I go crazy when I hear people speak about energy and no energy and what do we do and why don't we have and the bad Germans that are not giving us the money. You know, why should the German worker give money to an Italian because the Italians were not thrifty that I don't understand. But let's say I'm saying something unpopular here, but generally speaking, why do we complain about the energy situation and nobody speaks about research? It's research that will get us out of problems. It is research that will make us find new ways how we can better use, you know, let's say solar energy or water energy or hydrogen or you name it, something that your generation will invent. So that gives me um, an experience. So the society here, just like in Italy, imagines that research and innovation is something that um, should come out of the universities and the taxpayers are paying for it and uh, we don't have to worry about what happens after. Bullshit, right? We have to worry. I mean, I think that John Mario Verona, who was much more diplomatic than me, spoke how um, a former dean of Bocconi can speak. And I can, but I can tell you from a, from a perspective of, uh, of my perspective that that is bullshit, right? I mean, unless you do it, you meaning your group, um, there is not going to be the transfer of the innovation or of the findings for society. And, and why this is not more fostered, more aided is blows my mind because you already heard um, Professor Verona tell you that that is a proven fact that innovation comes um, and the advancement of society come from um, innovation and technology. 
So the same, certainly here, that schools and university systems do not really value the entrepreneurship. They don't, you know, you, a, a real truly academic person looks with great suspicion to anybody who sells out and, and does something commercial. As if commer your commercial is like you're horrible. Your commercial, you're like you have the, the plague, you have COVID because your commercial is, you know, your commercial, you're not a member of the academic elite that is pure enough. That is changing, hopefully changing with your um, generation, but is much still in the teaching and much still in much, many of the rather abstract and sterile way by which a lot of things are taught. Um, at best, the role that the universities have is to be non-obstructive. They don't really have a system to support um, young companies to come up. They're happy if it happens, but they're not necessarily doing anything about this. Obviously, there is not enough um, venture capital money. There is not enough business angels. There are not enough CEOs that are experienced or the clever Italians that go abroad, many of them um, sort of stay abroad. It's fantastic that um, uh, Piero Carminci, who will speak after me, is going back to Italy because that is exactly what we need to achieve, not only Italians, but from all over um, the world. And then I find at human technical, this is different. And in some institution where you are maybe different, but typically else there is no space. Another, um, let's say impediment is really sort of the fact that um, investments by people who have a little bit of money or a lot of money is scusami, not- Giulio, scusami, me. Um, se riusciamo a finire in cinque minuti. Okay. Okay, grazie. I was hoping that somebody was stopping me. Okay, so, um, I think that um, the notion here is that we need to build um, the uh, framework and the infrastructure that allow us to make the, the founding of company of company something um, straightforward, something that is um, well aligned with the mandate of um, institutions. And here there are some guidelines that I'm not going to go through about how institutions such as universities or research centers can make um, the creation of startup um, a little bit um, more easy. And clearly also at the political side, um, if you hear about all the sort of the notions that our countries and Italy and Austria are typical countries where the, the fear of immigration is inoculated into the population as if immigrants are our enemies, it is well known that immigration is an incredible source of talent for the, the, it's well known that the watch industry in Switzerland was done by refugees. In fact, um, Huguenot uh, refugees is known that um, the, the chances that an immigrant will make a patent in the US and in um, Austria and Germany is much higher than a non-immigrant and if you think about Google, if you think about Facebook, if you think about many, many companies, you will find that immigrants were actually the, the starters. So let's stop this political bullshit that, uh, that migration and immigration is a danger. It's, it's particularly for a country like Italy with no birth is absolutely necessary. Okay, and last, I was to say, it's, you, you're never too young. I mean, you, you can be younger and younger. Matthias, um, I think was 25 when he started this company, you can do it. Um, you, it should be time where more women are into um, this. Innovation is contagious here. I'm um, in 2017 with Christoph Huber, Kriso Huber here misspelled, um, the founders of BioNTech. Um, you know, it creates a, a lot of, uh, this is uh, my former boss until a few weeks ago um, who just received the Nobel Prize for Physics a few weeks ago, 10 days ago, and um, with, um, Manu Chapetier. So um, this is essentially my take home message. You have to try, you have to do it, and uh, you participate to um, a systems effect. And I'm, I'm happy to um, take questions. And I'm sorry, I like to speak. <laughs>